So let's repeat the theorem about a completely integrable system. Let m omega be a, a symplectic manifold provided with n many smooth functions such that the n many differentials are pointwise linearly independent, which we call geometrically independent. And secondly, um, their pairwise Poisson brackets commute, uh, vanish, fall ij from 1 to n. This is what we call dynamically independent. Dynamically independent. <clears throat> and suppose if we take the n many functions as coordinate functions for a map from m to rn and the preimage of 0 is non empty connected and compact then First of all, the pre-image set is a regular submanifold, n-dimensional submanifold, is an embedded Lagrangian torus. And there exists an open neighborhood U of N in M and neighborhoods of zero within Rn. And a diffeomorphism U, which maps the uh, sort of thickened torus, yeah, torus cross disk, diffeomorphically onto uh, a neighborhood of the uh, a foliated neighborhood of N, so coordinates x, y are mapped to u, x, y, and we have a diffeomorphism mu from d2 onto d1, which fixes zero such that U is a symplectic, so it's a symplectic neighborhood of the Lagrangian torus. And secondly, if we express F in this uh, coordinate change or in this diffeomorphism U and we renormalize the values of F by this map mu, then we uh, obtain exactly the y values. In particular, in particular, we have that every single torus with fixed y coordinate is uh, isomorphic to a component of this level set of C where C is the pre-image of Y. 
All right. Okay. So, so this situation is what we call a completely integrable system. And the theorem says that if we do have a completely integrable system, we can find coordinates in the neighborhood of this uh, 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 submanifold, um, which in particular has to be a torus, uh, which turns the completely integrable system into a system where uh, we have toroidal coordinates and um, vectorial coordinates, and these vectorial coordinates, the Hamiltonian in this, uh, um, uh, the, the flow leave, leaves these vectorial coordinates invariant. Yeah, so therefore, um, so if, uh, if H is one of those functions, let's say the last function, uh, or it's sufficient to say if H commutes with all those uh, functions, in particular if it is one of them, then, um, then N is invariant under the Hamiltonian flow and U conjugates conjugates the dynamical system of this Hamiltonian vector field um, to a system H0 of x, y is purely a function of y. And then uh, we have uh, x dot equals dh dy at y0, y dot equals 0, which means yt is constantly y0. Yeah? And um, if we define this to be omega of y, yeah? so this is, a, um, this is an n vector, yeah? the, the n-fold gradient of h in these n-many uh, variables, um, then we have x of t is x0 plus uh, yt times t. Yeah, so we have a quasi-periodic quasi motion on Tn. Yeah, and um, the uh, the uh, uh, orbit, orbit of x0, yeah, so r times x0, so this is the orbit, yeah, fills the torus densely, densely f the uh, n many coordinates of this frequency vectors are rationally independent, yeah? So they're independent over the rationals. Okay. Uh, so, um, we have already seen most pieces of the proof. So, uh, recall Proof four steps. First step was show that N is a Lagrangian torus. Yeah, this is what we have already done. This follows, I mean, this uses all those assumptions. 
Yeah, recall just by implicit function theorem, we know that n is an n-dimensional submanifold. And then we see the essential part is this dynamical independence, which means that if we take those n many different functions separately as uh, Hamiltonian functions generating some dynamical system, looking at those flows, from this condition it follows that those flows commute. And what we get is an Rn action on this manifold. Uh, and um, uh, and the stabilizer of this Rn action has to be a, a, a discrete a free abelian subgroup of Rn, which is a lattice. And it, and it has to be uh, isomorphic to Zn uh, by the assumption of the compactness of the, sub, uh, of the subset. Yeah, um, so that, this this implies it has to be a torus, and the fact that the sublevels that the submanifold is Lagrangian, we also proved explicitly. Okay, so this is this this tells us that we have uh, this um, this Lagrangian torus, and uh, let's see, the, right, we had this map. Yeah, we fix some point p, and then we have this map uh, phi p uh, R n on to n by saying uh, if we take those uh, n different time variables, yeah, each, each uh, for, uh, for the different ith flow, then we apply these, uh, these flow maps. Um, so this is phi p of, sorry, of s is phi s1 of x f1 composed phi s2 of x f2 up to phi sn of Hamiltonian field of fn, all that applied to p. Right, so this was the um, idea. And then the second step, second step was, um, it's this uh, theorem, theorem of Leoville, where I've not given you the proof. It's, uh, the proof is not too complicated. It's a combination of the same argument which gives us in the linear algebra a symplectic basis together with a, a version of Frobenius theorem uh, which, uh, which is essentially telling us something about uh, commuting flows. Or another proof works with the so-called method of generating functions and this is what I'm going to show you today. So the theorem of Liouville tells us we can uh, extend um, the n many functions yeah, locally, locally at p to functions gn, G, uh, g1 to gn, fn to fn, which become uh, symplectic coordinates, local symplectic coordinates near P. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so the picture is, here is the torus, yeah, which is covered by the, by the map phi P, which we have. And here's some point P on the torus from where the, these n many flows uh, run and cover the whole torus. And around P, we have this uh, little ball of symplectic coordinates. And the intersection with the torus is an n-dimensional uh, submanifold, yeah? uh, an n-dimensional disk or sub-ball in this two-n-dimensional ball. So the question is, why can't we take the, this flow map applied to the whole ball, cover our torus, and then, then we are done? Well, the problem is, so third step is exactly this, yeah? So con uh, extend, extend this map um, so the notation for this local coordinates will be where is that? Uh, ah, yeah. This is this is the map U. Yeah. So we have U is this map 
uh, or let's call this is phi and u is phi inverse. It's a well-defined map on some neighborhood in some zero neighborhood R to N onto a neighborhood of P in M. Yeah? And so now we want to extend um, uh, U to a neighborhood of N. Okay, and uh, so what is the problem? Uh, so um, st we start with uh, we start with the map theta. So um, and theta, we want to extend both maps. We have u locally and to n dimensionally, and we have phi p globally and n dimensionally. We want to combine them. So what we would like to do is we we would like to say okay, take u uh, at zero, u at zero is the point p, and only use the transversal n-many coordinates in the y direction yeah, on some neighborhood which we would like to call, this will be the neighborhood d2, and then instead of using those local x coordinates which are along this uh, piece of the torus, we use phi p in these x coordinates. Now we use the we identify the x coordinates with the time variables because this is exactly um, what these functions, these uh, 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 what these flows provide us with. Yeah? We've already seen that if we take those functions. Um, then uh, 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 the, the symplectic G coordinates uh, can be identified with those time functions. Okay, so, um, so we take those transverse Y coordinates, um, yeah, so these are the Y coordinates, and we take those X coordinates over the torus. We want to combine them. So where's the problem? It looks uh, uh, this is definitely a well-defined map into M. The problem is, as long as Y is zero, we know we cover the whole torus, and we know what the periods are. Yeah, we know that there is precisely this one lattice isomorphic to Zn, such that all those lattice vectors in, uh, plugged into X bring us back to the same point P. However, if we deviate in the y direction, it's absolutely not clear that this very same concrete lattice is the same periodicity lattice also if we are off the torus. And in general, this is exactly what's going to happen. Yeah? If, we, if we move in one y direction, the torus might become larger, yeah? the, the lattice might change and expand in the other direction, it might become smaller. Um, so, yeah, so problem, problem, uh, theta, so x of y plus, uh, sorry, x plus gamma y of y equals theta of x, y, yeah? So we might have um, a y dependence on this, uh, on, on those periods. Okay, so we have to deal with that, and this is what I'm going to show today. And then there is a final step, fourth step, is um, uh, after finding suitable y-dependent lattices, gamma of y, isomorphic to Zn within Rn, 
um, we need yeah, we need to renormalize yeah uh, to uh, um, a y independent lattice in order to provide uh, one map u on rn mod zn cross d2 into this neighborhood uh, of n. Yeah, the point is we want to describe our uh, uh, torus neighborhoods as a map as a on on the product one fixed torus cross a disk. Yeah, and we do not want uh, a dependence of this lattice here on those coordinates. Yeah, some bundle situation. Yeah, and this is possible. Yeah, if this would not be possible, okay, then we. We stop with that and use those coordinates, but it's definitely possible to renormalize that. However, that requires that. So this will be a, a nonlinear coordinate change, both yeah, in the y and x coordinates, because we still want that this map is uh, symplectic. And this will require a, a change in those y coordinates so that um, the uh, so that um, we we are still provided uh, uh, with y as the um, uh, that we recover the the, the y coordinates as uh, as parameterizing the leaves of the uh, 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 of the different tori. Yeah, so we have to find this map mu again. Okay, so concerning. Concerning step three, this is what I'm going to show. So, uh, okay, so we have this map theta, right? It's there on the board. Theta, if we Freeze the y coordinates uh, in in zero. It's the uh, original map phi, yeah, which we already have. Yeah? So, so theta of x zero is uh, phi uh, uh, p x applied to u zero zero. Okay, so choose K in Rn compact and large enough, large enough such that the lattice gamma zero is contained in K. Yeah? Remember, um, for all gamma in uh, gamma zero, we had that. Um, Phi of x plus gamma um, uh, p equals phi x p. Yeah? So this is exactly this was this periodicity lattice. Uh, if we are on the original torus n, yeah. So gamma zero is z times. So we have a basis for that gamma one plus. Z gamma n. Yeah, we fix we fix some generating set gamma one to gamma n. Um, so that means we have theta of x plus gamma i zero is theta of x zero. Um, so problem. Repeat that again. Problem for y non-zero. We we lose the gamma periodicity. Yeah, and, and it's still periodic, maybe, but with a different lattice. Um, so, uh, so consider consider a fixed lattice vector gamma i, and the local coordinates around P, which we have from step two. 
and u v0 to, uh, what was this neighborhood called, v u of p um, from step two. And we combine this, yeah, so we have some little ball, some delta ball, we have a map into R to N by saying F of X, Y is, so um, we compose the flow with respect to this fixed lattice vector with its local coordinates. So this means, so here, here's our ball, which is, uh, which is, um, which is described by u, yeah? a whole two n dimensional ball. Yeah? And now we take this map u, which covers this ball, and move this um, with the gamma i flow for a fixed gamma i. So if, um, if delta is small enough, yeah, so this will be moved to some, so this will be displaced in a disjoint way. Yeah, so here is gamma i moving that off, off the ball. And, uh, and for, and then we take, uh, we take u inverse carefully. What am I, oh, uh, u inverse, wait, 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 wait. Uh, ah, sorry, uh, it was nonsense what I said. Excuse me, it was complete nonsense. So if y is zero, yeah, gamma i is a lattice vector. So if y is zero, this very point in the origin is mapped by this gamma i point to itself. Yeah, and um, as long, sorry, as long as we plug in y equals zero, we have the identity map, nothing happens. So now we are interested in, um, or at least locally, yeah, what does this one lattice vector, this periodicity vector, create? What kind of distortion does it create if we move off, off the torus with y, non, with y being non-zero? Okay, so what we know is F is still a symplectic diffeomorphism. And if delta is small, we know that this ball is contained in the compact set cross the original uh, zero disk. Yeah. So things are well defined. Okay, so this, this map F, how does it look like? Uh, F is of the form F of X looks like we definitely know that F preserves the Y coordinate. This is a Y. Yeah, because so uh, U is a um, U U are U are the symplectic coordinates from this uh, Liouville theorem, where the Y coordinates are given by these functions. Which means, um, since this is the flow yeah, for the ith, for the Hamiltonian vector field of the ith function, the, all those f coordinates, f functions, are invariant under this flow, and then we, then we take the inverse. Which means this map preserves y. And it, it changes somehow the, coordinate, the, the, the first coordinate. So in general, yeah, if we describe these coordinates with new uh, uh, letters, xi and eta, then at least the xi is some function of x and y. Eta is identically y. Yeah? In particular, what we have is, in, uh, uh, in general, even if we didn't have identity here, we still, so we, we definitely know d eta by dy is invertible. Okay, so this is, this is the beginning of uh, a very general method. 
It's the method of uh, generating functions. So let's see how that goes. So if we have a symplectic transformation, coordinate transformation, such that so these are n many coordinates, those are n many coordinates, and the assumption is that the second uh, half of the n many coordinates derived by the second half of the input coordinates is invertible. It's an invertible n by n matrix. So that means by implicit function theorem, it means we can express, so we can locally invert in these n many coordinates and we can express psi as a function of x and eta. So we, we invert by the, by the second set and decide that we use the coordinates x1 to xn and eta1 to eta n as the independent coordinates and all the other ones y and xi as the dependent coordinates. Okay, so um, so this property in, uh, in coordinates means, um, means um, d xi d eta equals dx dy. So this is ultra short uh, notation. In, yeah, so this means Einstein sum, uh, summation convention. This is sum i equals one to n of d xi i wedge d eta y. Yeah, so it's a sh short notation. So um, we can also write this as um, uh, uh, now I okay since I decided to take x and eta as the independent coordinates I write this as d of psi d eta um, uh, equals um, minus d of y dx. Yeah, or if I bring this to the other side, d of xi d eta plus y dx equals zero. So all this is a local computation. It's a local computation in uh, uh, R2n cross R2n. So it's a local computation in, R, uh, uh, in R4n around the origin. Yeah, we are close to the origin. So this or so since it's a local computation, uh, we know we can simply say that whenever a closed whenever a one form is closed, it is exact. So um, that means there exists a, a function S in the variables um, X and eta because those are the independent variables. Uh, unique, unique up to a constant such that this one form uh, xi d eta plus y dx can be expressed as the differ differential of a function, which is um, ds by uh, dx dx plus ds by um, d eta d eta. Okay, and now we can compare coefficients, and this means psi, which we know is some function of x in eta, uh, can be identified with um, ds d eta at psi eta. And um, the other one was y, y equals uh, uh, ds uh, dx uh, of uh, psi and eta. Okay. Um, so this means um, now we use the fact that eta is identically uh, to identically y, so that means uh, um, 
that means S can be written uh, uh, follows um, Uh, okay, uh, yeah, right. Follows, um, we can write x and y uh, in the form um, um, Oh, let's, let's put it like this, sorry. Um, let uh, Q of X eta be, so this is simply a definition, X times eta minus S of X eta, which means um, we can write Xi, Xi of X eta, which is ds d eta, this is the same as um, d q uh, d uh, uh, this is the same as uh, x minus d q d eta and y which is um, d s d x um, this is uh, so S is X eta minus DQ. So this is uh, eta minus DQ DX. And now using the fact that we know that Y is identically eta, we see that DQ DX has to be zero. Yeah, this, is the, this is the trick why I'm uh, uh, changing this function. So follows, follows we have the function Q, which is purely a function in eta, or equivalently a function in y, and x of x, y is x minus dq dy at y. Okay, now we go back into what we had here. Yeah, so um, that means, let's put this together, U inverse composed phi gamma i composed u at x, y can be written as, so this is all a local computation, locally for delta small enough, can be written as x minus dq dy at y comma y. And um, since uh, s is since s is only determined up to a constant, um, we know that for y uh, being zero, this has to be identity. So we can set q of uh, zero to be zero and dq dq dy at zero is uh, we know uh, this is zero as well. Okay, so what is this good for? Right, so that means uh, let, so set V of Y to be this DQ DY at Y. So that means x minus v of y comma y. Yeah, this is, I'm just rewriting this here. U inverse composed phi gamma composed u applied to x, y. Uh, um, on the other side, we know that uh, u composed 
phi compose u inverse applied to x, y, where we use um, this vector, v, y, yeah, what, what, whatever vector we use up here, it corresponds, um, it corresponds to a shift in the uh, in the v uh, in in the uh, in the x direction. So this is exactly the same as this. So that that means what we have is u of x y has to be phi gamma plus v y u of x y. This is exactly what we have achieved now. So we have yeah. So the the goal was to see, so as long, so repeat, as long as y is identically zero, we know that gamma is one of these, uh, or it was actually gamma y, gamma i, one of these uh, lattice vectors which describe the periodicity for y being identically zero. And now we have seen we need some correction term depending on y, which describes the, the periodicity in the x direction if, if y is off zero. So for any of these n many spanning vectors of the lattice, we, we will find a correction term which describes the periodicity. So in general, so what we will have we will have for every we will we will have a um, a new y dependent lattice where gamma i equals some j equals one to n uh, n j gamma uh, uh, n j times gamma i plus v i of y. So this is, this is the new lattice, which for each, for each y is uh, still isomorphic to Zn. Yeah, so vi at zero is zero. This is this condition here. And, uh, and now we have y dependently uh, dependent um, this, this new lattice. Okay, um, of course we have to show a little bit. We have to show if y is small enough, not far to zero, then, um, then uh, this is still a rank n lattice, yeah? So that these, the, that these vectors are still, uh, 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 still uh, um, yeah, yeah, linearly independent, yeah? And being, uh, and uh, generating a discrete free, ab a free abelian group. And uh, so the uh, so what we have is we have now the very same map theta in the beginning. Oh, it's still on the board here, on the second board. We keep this map, but we can now describe the periodicity. Uh, uh, for all possible y. So we have theta rn cross d20 into m. It's still a symplectic map, but now we know that if we take any such gamma of y, this is describing the periodicity. Oh. Okay. So uh, why aren't we ready now? Yeah, we uh, done now. We could say, well, it's wonderful. Uh, if we mod by this y-dependent lattice, what we get is for every y in this small Rn neighborhood around zero, for every y, we have a map from torus onto diffeomorphically onto a Lagrangian submanifold. Well, the problem is, it's these are nice symplectic coordinates, but what we claimed is that we find some uh, coordinates for some fixed lattice. Yeah, in some uh, uh, zero neighborhood uh, onto uh, a torus neighborhood. So what we now need to do is we have to, 
uh, we have to find a um, uh, a basis change yeah, from this y dependence Rn basis onto a constant basis. Yeah, uh, which for each y linearly would be possible. But if we do this, we are distorting the coordinates so, it's, so that it's not symplectic anymore. And, um, and we, yeah, so if we distort the coordinates now in the x direction, in order to keep it symplectic, we have to catch it up suitably in the y coordinates. And that this is possible is, a, is another step. And it's again an application of uh, such a kind of generating uh, functions theorem uh, theory actually it just met us playing a little bit with these coordinates and using those uh, this this q function in a in a clever way which I actually not do anymore uh, it would cost too much time and not give much deeper insight okay so I want to finish here the sketch of the proof what I wanted to show you is uh, this use of the generating functions method. So the idea of generating functions is uh, if we have a symplectic diffeomorphism locally we can try to describe it uh, give uh, in terms of a function. Yeah? So it, it, yeah, a, a symplectic diffeomorphism locally comes from a function. And this is a different relation to a function than thinking of it as a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. This is somehow related as well, but in a different way. And um, what I've done here is a local computation in R2n with explicit coordinates, but you can also sort of um, generally, without coordinates, understand what's going on. What's going on here is saying, if you consider the graph of phi, so you understand a map if you understand the graph. And the graph of phi is a subset of m cross m. If you view it as a subset of m cross m, and on the product you take this twisted symplectic form, omega plus minus omega, yeah, it's like bringing this second pair over to the other side with a minus sign. Yeah? Then phi is symplectic if and only if the graph is Lagrangian in m cross m with respect to this form. Yeah? And, uh, and then the, uh, the next trick is something which I think I haven't shown you. Uh, every Lagrangian submanifold which is su sufficiently close to another Lagrangian submanifold, or, or let's put it like this: for every Lagrangian submanifold, we f we always find a tubular neighborhood with symplectic coordinates such that the tubular neighborhood looks like a cotangent bundle, where the Lagrangian submanifold corresponds to the zero section. This symplectic tubular neighborhood is called the Weinstein neighborhood. So this is a, this is a theorem which is not too hard. It's practically a, it's a sort of a generalization of Dabu's theorem. Dabu coordinates tell you how symplectically a neighborhood of a point looks like. Weinstein neighborhood tells you how symplectically a neighborhood of Lagrangian manifold looks like. And now the idea is, if you have the graph of a symplectic diffeomorphism, it's Lagrangian and m cross m. And if phi is close enough to the identity, that's the condition which we need, which corresponds to this condition here. If phi is close enough to identity, then identity is Lagrangian as well. So you take a Weinstein neighborhood of the identity, which is essentially T star m. So you can think of the graph of phi sitting in T star m. Um, but um, if phi is close to identity, the graph is the image of a section in the cotangent bundle. So what is a section in the cotangent bundle? It's a one form. And then you can show the graph of phi, which you identify with the with the, with the image of a one form, um, is, some, is Lagrangian if and only if the one form is closed. 
So the graph of a symplectic diffeomorphism corresponds to a closed one form. So in local coordinates R to n, this is the closed one form. And the closed one form can be, not necessarily is, can be the, uh, uh, can be the differential of a function. So it's a cohomological condition. Yeah? At least locally this is true. Uh, globally this is an additional condition which we have to uh, assume. Yeah? And, uh, and the corresponding function whose differential gives us the graph of phi, that's the so-called generating function. If you look in literature, in particular in physics literature, literature, you often find several different kind of generating functions. Diff generating function of the first kind, of the second kind, of the third kind. Um, essentially, it all boils down to the same idea. And it's just a matter of um, uh, what kind of assumption you put in here. Yeah? So here in this picture, you have four different sets of n coordinates and x coordinates, and y coordinates, and xi, and, uh, and eta coordinates. And you could equal, so here we make the assumption that eta is completely dependent on y, and invertibly so. But you could also have the condition that d xi by d eta is invertible, yeah? or d eta by d x is invertible, and so on. Yeah, any, any combination uh, could be possible. And depending on this con uh, condition, this tells you what in this technique you, you consider as independent variables and what are the dependent variables. Yeah, in this picture, it's sort of saying that if you take the graph of phi and you want to compare it in the Weinstein neighborhood uh, with the closed one form, it depends on sort of, do I compare it to the identity or to a different canonical symplectic diffeomorphism? Yeah, so these are the different versions. Um, so this generating function technique is a very useful technique also for numerical computations. Um, uh, so it turns out in statistics nowadays for like, Roughly 10 years now, the last 10 years, there has been an interesting recent development in, in Monte Carlo techniques yeah, for integration, especially in, in applied mathematics, um, where, uh, um, where Hamiltonian systems are used. Why are Hamiltonian systems used? Because in, for Monte Carlo techniques, you would like to have a sort of ergodic systems. You know, it's, you're using an averaging principle. You know, you're using the ergodic, uh, you're assuming ergodicity by saying that if you want to compute the, uh, the mean value of a function on a given um, uh, uh, phase space, um, by saying if you have an uh, ergodic dynamical system, you simply average the function along an orbit. Yeah? So you're looking for ergodic systems. And um, and it turns out so so here is again where sort of this Boltzmann hypothesis comes in. Uh, often, uh, Hamilton or uh, it turn, many or like seemingly generic Hamiltonian systems look agoric. Yeah, and it, uh, and so in in physics and statistics they have just uh, started on using like uh, generic Hamiltonian systems. And they, uh, they seem to compute in a wonderful way and much faster converging Monte Carlo techniques. Um, so if you want to perform this numerically, what you have to do is you have to compute time one maps of Hamiltonian systems. And this is where generating functions come in. Because um, once you have a generating function for a diffeomorphism, even if it is only approximately a generating function, if you, if you use those derivatives to describe a map, the map will definitely be de uh, symplectic. Yeah? It, might, it might deviate a little bit from the symplectic map which you want here yeah, by some rounding errors, but it will definitely be symplectic. And once it is symplectic, you have a very good chance that it gives you a, a good uh, Monte Carlo technique. And these um, so-called Hamiltonian Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques are now heavily used in statistics um, and give much better computations. 
So what's behind that is essentially generating functions. Okay, so this was a little deviation. Um, now in the remaining time, I wanted to tell you something about KM theory. So, so what is KM theory? Uh, okay, let me first give you the theorem. It will look terrible. Okay, so it continues from a completely integrable system. So we can go on right from what we've proven. So we had these n many functions, geometrically, dynamically independent. And let's denote the what, what was denoted by n before I now denote um, by L. So this is our Lagrangian torus in M. Yeah, so uh, so it's the Joint, it's the uh, the joint in or so the intersection of n many uh, hypersurfaces. Okay, and the statement was that we find some neighborhood U of this Lagrangian torus and coordinates, uh, which, if I write it like this, can be seen as a map from the neighborhood into T n cross R n. It's not necessarily on two. It will it will only uh, sort of cover a uh, a subset Tn cross some disk in general. Mm -hmm. um, and those coordinates, uh, if I say x, y are, uh, are, the, co are the coordinates in the, uh, in the manifold M, then we will get uh, action angle coordinates, action or better angle action coordinates uh, on this neighborhood. Yeah? So I is the action and those are the angles. So we have I1 up to IN. This is what I had before, mu uh, composed, uh, U composed, uh, sorry, composed F. 1 to Fn composed uh, U inverse, right? Yeah. So I think what was U before is now U inverse. Um, so in particular, in these coordinates, if I have a Hamiltonian which uh, pairwise commutes with these functions, then this Hamiltonian system in these action angle coordinates looks like a function only in the i coordinates. So this is what I've written before, and uh, theta is dh di at i, and i is constant. In particular, theta of t is theta zero plus omega i times t. Okay, and um, what I already said, so this is a quasi periodic motion on L, yeah, with frequency vector omega i. Let's look at the same thing uh, again. Suppose we have such a frequency vector alpha. Yeah, so what is, what is omega there is now one concrete alpha. And we consider the vector field 
x alpha to be i equals 1 to n alpha i d d theta i. Yeah? So this statement is we have found in our completely integrable system, we have found, we have found coordinates such that the flow on this one concrete torus uh, with uh, action coordinate zero is given by uh, such a vector field on Tn. Yeah? So we say um, definition an invariant Lagrangian torus Ln within some symplectic uh, manifold for a uh, Hamiltonian vector field xh, this is what invariant corresponds to, is called an alpha quasi periodic torus if and only if we find a diffeomorphism onto Tn, some smooth diffeo, such that the push forward of the Hamiltonian field along this torus is such a standardized uh, uh, translational vector field. Um, clearly, what we have proven, or whenever we have an invariant Lagrangian torus, we can always find a whole symplectic neighborhood, and, and we can extend this diffeomorphism to a whole neighborhood, bringing our vector field into this form. Why that? Because um, any diffeomorphism on an n-dimensional manifold extends by its Jacobian to a diffeomorphism of the whole cotangent bundle of that manifold. And, and, and that diffeomorphism induced, yeah, so if, if phi is a diffeomorphism uh, of Tn, then um, the push forward map gives us a diffeomorphism of the cotangent bundle, which is automatically, with respect to the Liouville structure, symplectic. Yeah, so, so that means um, um, this invariant, so this, this alpha is really uh, a, a concrete invariant of the given uh, Lagrangian torus. Okay. Um, Right, so now we go back to our completely integrable system. Now we look at this situation here. And this here is alpha. Yeah? And alpha depends, depends on i. Yeah? And, um, oh, uh, actually, so, yeah, this here, this here is alpha. Yeah? So, the, if we have a completely integrable system, we find a coordinate uh, situation which turns the given Hamiltonian into a Hamiltonian which only depends on the uh, action coordinates. But this is definitely a non-trivial function in these action coordinates. And the gradient of this function in the action coordinates, that's our um, frequency vector. So that means the frequency vector itself depends on i. Yeah, remember, we not only have this one Lagrangian torus, which was the pre-image of zero of our functions, we have a whole neighborhood foliated by different invariant tori. And on each invariant torus, we have a different derivative. So we, have, we might have a different um, periodicity vector, alpha. So, this is the interesting part. Um, we say uh, for the 
completely integrable system in action angle coordinates, so H0 being a function of I, we say uh, that the so-called twist condition twist condition is fulfilled fulfilled if and only if the way how this frequency vector depends on the action coordinates. So the yeah, if the determinant of this n by n matrix, which is the same as the uh, second derivative of H0, yeah, so it's the Hessian of H0 in the n many y coord i coordinates, yeah, if this is non-zero. And moreover, we say a concrete uh, action vector Rn is called is called resonant if and only if the corresponding frequencies, yeah, which which are. Uh, dh0 by di at i0 up to dh0 by di1 and dh0 by din y0 are um, uh, rationally dependent. Yeah, so this is so we, we say we have a resonance if um, there's somehow um, a, a rational linear combination of the zero vector by some of these frequencies. Yeah, uh, and that means um, if we have such a rational dependence, that means uh, uh, that any orbit of that. Uh, invariant torus corresponding to this, um, sorry, uh, I zero uh, vector will not be dense in the torus. It might not be closed as a one dimensional curve. It might still fill out densely a lower dimensional sub torus. Yeah. So there, so there are different degrees of resonance. Yeah. So it's extremely resonant as if if every orbit um, uh, closes up. Um, it identically closes up, yeah, is a periodic orbit, yeah, but um, we can also have this situation that in this whole n-dimensional torus, like if maybe a two-dimensional torus is densely filled or a three-dimensional subtorus, so it depends on how many of these numbers um, linear are rationally, uh, rationally combining the zero. Yeah. Okay, so now compared with the twist condition, this twist condition tells us that um, this map omega as a map from Rn to Rn locally is locally is a diffeomorphism. Um, so that means um, it, that means if we perturb a little bit the I zero vector. We can always find resonant uh, vectors, resonant conditions, as well as non-resonant conditions. So that means twist condition twist condition implies the resonant tori, resonant tori um, uh, 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 form a dense subset uh, uh, of Rn. 
Yeah, so, uh, so every, every fixed vector in our uh, action uh, uh, coordinate set, Rn, corresponds to a concrete invariant torus yeah, for this completely integrable system. Yeah, so we have, we have a dense coexistence of resonant tori and non-resonant tori. Yeah? If we perturb a little bit uh, a given torus, or if we change a little bit this i vector, yeah, our initial value problem, if we start with different action variables, we might have as well a resonant uh, a situation as well as a non-resonant one. If the twist condition is fulfilled. So twist condition means uh, the Hessian is non-degenerate. So which means that this Hamiltonian, at least quadratically, depends on the action variables. Okay, so now we have almost everything in place to formulate the KM theorem. Right. Okay, uh, so now I'm. Okay, I'm. What I'm formulating now might look quite cryptic and it needs a lot of. I mean, it needs a longer explanation. If time permits, I will give that. But let's start from the beginning. So let tau be some positive real number, c a positive constant, and alpha be a frequency vector belonging to a set of vectors satisfying a certain so-called Diophantine condition. So this is a number theoretical condition, which means the following. It's the set of all frequency vectors omega with the property that uh, if I take the infimum over all integral vectors j such that the sum of coordinates, yeah, so modulus j is j1 plus j2 up to jn, so the sum of coordinates being less or equal than a natural number q, and I take the scalar product of j as an integral vector with omega being a real vector, uh, and the modulus of that and I want that this infimum is bigger or equal than the constant c over q to the n plus tau minus 1 for all q in n. So I don't think, I don't expect anybody to understand what's written there. I'm explaining it in a moment. Um, let's say the following. Suppose n equals 1, then we just talk about a real number, just one frequency. Yeah, and um, so, so the torus we would be talking about is an S1. And the question is, so the frequency would tell us whether in time 1 the orbit closes up or not. Yeah. So in general, so we have two situations, omega could be rational or non-rational. And this quantity for n equals 1 would describe a very strong condition on measuring how well an irrational number can be approximated by rational numbers. So let me, so let's just be sort of uh, uh, heuristic, um, suppose, suppose alpha is an uh, irrational number, so it's so a one-dimensional situation, then um, what we can do is we can write alpha as the largest integral part uh, in alpha um, plus 
one over, and then, then, we, when have, uh, then we can write it as a continued fraction. Some number A1, so the remainder alpha minus the rounded term is a number between zero and one. We invert it. If we invert it, we can again round off, and, uh, then, and then we repeat this as a continued fraction. Yeah? So every real number can be expressed as an integer plus a continued fraction. And uh, if you express it in a continuous, so what you get is this integer and a sequence of integers. Every ai is an integer. And you, we would say, we can say, so if, if any of these integers is very, very large, then that would mean the corresponding uh, uh, fraction with that large number as the first term here would be very close to zero. So this means if we have uh, somewhere in the sequence a very large natural number, we could sort of cut it off and use the, the finitely many terms which would then give me a rational numbers. So this is sort of a way of approximating irrational numbers by rational numbers. Take continued fraction, cutting off somewhere. And you have a very good approximation if you, if you, have, if you manage to cut off uh, at a place where the integer is very large. So in that sense, what would be the, um, the rational number which, ca which would be the, uh, in that sense, the least well rationally approximable number? It's the number which has ones everywhere. And that's the uh, golden ratio. Yeah. So in that sense, the golden ratio would be the most irrational number. And this is a rigorous way of quantifying approximability of irrational numbers by rational numbers, even if it's in higher dimension, if you have a, if you have a vector of, uh, of irrational numbers. Another way of, of understanding this would be in this situation, again, where n is 1. We could say um, an, uh, any number alpha can be seen as the, as the slope of a line. You put this line in R2 and you have the integral lattice, yeah, Z2, and you, and you look at the, uh, the smallest distance of any of these lattice vectors to the line. So if, the, if you have a rational slope, you will find uh, one of these lattice points on the line, so the distance is zero. Yeah, so the so alpha is irrational if um, uh, if you find no no lattice vector on the line. Okay, so the distance in the sense of its femur could still be zero. It simply depends on how far you have to look, have to go away from the origin to look for a lattice vector, which which becomes very close to the line. And the farer you allowed to look, the closer you might get to the line. And this is this this is this quotient. So the, so q q corresponds. So if in, if n equals one, q would correspond to the denominator of the rational number approximating or it would correspond to the distance of the lattice vector to zero, which you need in order to approximate it very well. Yeah? So this exponent, this exponent is describing um, how well you can approximate uh, 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 how close lattice vector become to the line if you, if you go far away from the origin. Okay, so let's keep it with that for a moment. Um, so this means um, you have resonant conditions, and then you have uh, you have non-resonant conditions where um, the entire vector, all, all the coefficients are rationally uh, independent. But and, and then you ask, okay, how rationally independent are they? And that's a way to quantify this. Yeah, and the larger you get, the larger the tau you can, um, no, no, the smaller the tau you can get, 
which means also the, 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 this, the more slowly this infimum goes to zero as Q increases, the, the less resonant this vector is. Okay, so now the statement dynamically will be resonance is bad, non-resonant is good. Non-resonant means things are stable. And this will be the theorem now. Ah, I think, do I have a board? Oh, yeah. Theorem. Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser. This is what KM stands for. Uh, so let, let H be a smooth Hamiltonian, smooth Hamiltonian, tau be positive, C be positive, alpha be a, a vector, yeah, a frequency vector in the set D tau C, yeah, D for Diophantine condition, so a sort of strongly tau, strongly non-resident vector, and so let Ln in the symplectic situation be an alpha quasi periodic invariant Lagrangian torus. So I'm not assuming here completely integrable system, but, but this could be one of these situations. Um, uh, invariant, so invariant uh, under the Hamiltonian vector field of that Hamiltonian um, satisfy or fulfilling or satisfying the twist condition. Twist condition. So what I, okay, uh, so the definition was a little bit short. Um, I only gave you the definition of the twist condition in the situation of a completely integrable system. However, with this argument, you can show that uh, it suffices to know what the torus is and how the um, vector field on this torus looks like um, to, sh to, see, um, um, to see whether the twist condition is fulfilled. Yeah? So, so for example, so for simply, for example, completely integrable system. Um, so if a twist condition is fulfilled, so then the statement is, then there exist neighborhoods, first of all, of this frequency vector alpha, a neighborhood of this Lagrangian torus, and a neighborhood of the given Hamiltonian within this set of smooth functions, such that for all Hamiltonians, which might be a perturbation, is a smooth, a small smooth perturbation of the Hamiltonian, and beta be another strongly tau C non-resonant frequency vector, the Hamiltonian, this is now the statement, the Hamiltonian vector field XH twiddle um, possesses, possesses beta quasi periodic smooth H tilde invariant uh, Lagrange, uh, Lagrange tori in the given neighborhood of L, um, and moreover, additionally, uh, 
and uh, for any given such non-resonant frequency vector beta, we have that if we think of this as a map, um, Lagrange tori, so the corresponding torus which we find, so let's say we can, we always find one concrete torus and we call that torus T of beta and H, t H tilde. So this is a uh, uh, fresh smooth, yeah, if we take the fresh topology of the smooth functions and, and this is the important statement, if I take the union of all those beta of these tori, yeah, so this is a subset of our, uh, of our symplectic manifold. This has positive uh, measure. In fact, the measure is, becomes larger the smaller we make these neighborhoods. Okay, so let's repeat the statement. The statement is, so think of a completely integrable system um, where we describe, where we can describe the twist condition, though the, 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 um, the essential sufficient condition is this twist condition. It's the situation that we, we might look at one invariant Lagrangian torus, but in the neighborhood, um, depending on these action variables, we find, we, ha we find this foliation by invariant tori, and on each of these neighbor tori, we have different frequency vectors. And um, this map, which, which maps action coordinates to frequency vectors, is locally invertible. That's the twist condition. So, a priori, this condition um, uh, sounds like we have a dense set of resonant tori. Um, however, we will also have a dense set of non-resonant tori. And um, if we pick out one concrete, strongly non-resonant torus, satisfying where the frequency vector satisfies this complicated diophantine condition. So is very lousily approximable by rational numbers. Then this torus turns out to be very robust in the sense that if we now perturb the Hamiltonian system, we might think in the very moment we change the Hamiltonian, the torus disintegrates but it will not. Uh, it, will, it might be deformed and the very same torus will survive and even more in, in, in the entire neighborhood will still keep a lot of tori. Remember, due to the twist condition in a neighborhood we have a lot of resonant tori which will quite quickly disintegrate. I will say in a moment what disintegration means. But we will also have strongly resonant tori satisfying diophantine conditions and they will remain. And the set of tori which remains as invariant Lagrange tori will fill out positive measure. It's not just dense, it's of positive measure. Okay, um, so what does that mean now? Now the application. So application or corollary application under these assumptions smoothly generic ergodicity is wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, if you have a set of positive measure, which is um, which is the union of invariant Lagrangian tori, then this set itself is invariant. So you will have an invariant subset, which cannot be the entire subset, because we will definitely. So this is the other thing you you have to show um, that um, the that not everything stays invariant. 
Yeah, so clearly, uh, if you have a completely integrable system and the entire face space is foliated by tori, then of course, uh, ergodicity is still, uh, no, 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 of course not, ergodicity is not true. Because you can pick, yeah, you just take a set of action variables and take those unions yeah, and you, ha you will have an invariant subset which is not everything. Yeah, so ergodicity means the only invariant subsets are everything or the empty or of measure zero. Yeah, of full measure of measure. And in a completely integrable system, you can sort of you can you can choose yeah, how big you want to make your, your invariant subset. And this situation survives under perturbations, smooth perturbations. This is what, what KM theory says. So in this mathematical sense, smooth, small, smooth perturbations, Boltzmann hypothesis is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what physicists, chemists, and so on um, uh, uh, then do is say, well, uh, this is not the set of perturbations we think of. Yeah, so we think of still a particular class of dynamical system, like uh, this Boltzmann gas, yeah, colliding balls. And if we just take such Hamiltonian systems of only, of only this particular type, and if only perturbed within this much smaller class of Hamiltonians, then we still think that generically a godicity holds. And this is, in the strict sense, still open. Yeah. OK. Um, oh, yeah, time is out. Um, I wanted to say two things. What I will not be able to do is to say more about this Diophantine condition, uh, but I'm not sure this is um, that uh, this will be very helpful. I think the best explanation is still this year. Um, uh, uh, the continued fraction as a very efficient tool to approximate irrational numbers by rational ones. Uh, and now I want to make two remarks. First, what does this disintegration of Lagrange and Tour I mean? Um, it's, the, it's the following thing. Um, remember this picture I drew of a completely integrable system. Um, so it's a sort of, it looks like a three-dimensional picture, but you th should think in, in even dimensions. So this is one Lagrange and torus, which I just cut open to illustrate certain things. And, and we have this whole family of Lagrange and Tore, yeah? So they have, yeah, we have a whole neighborhood foliated by them. Um, so how can you sort of understand the situation? Take a hypersurface which sort of intersects this Tore in a transverse way and turn this continuous flow into a discrete dynamical system. Yeah, just look at for each orbit, yeah, which is on such a torus and it is winding peri quasi periodically around. Just look at the point when this when this orbit hits this surface. This gives a point. So, for example, m is a four-dimensional manifold. You have a completely integrable system, two functions. Uh, and you take one of them as the energy function, and then within three-dimensional energy space, uh, energy hypersurface, you have these two-dimensional tori. And then you take, uh, in this three-dimensional energy surface, you take a, a three-dimensional uh, cross-section. We call this a Poincaré section. Yeah? And for each point, you have the orbit. And the information which you lose is simply the amount of time that, that it needs for the orbit to hit the surface the next time. So if you look now in the frontal way on this Poincaré sectional surface, then the invariant tori look like closed circles, right? Yeah, so for each torus, depending on the actual variables, you have a certain closed circle. Yeah? And in the completely integrable situation is that the whole two-dimensional sectional surface is foliated by closed uh, circles. Yeah? Uh, nice concentric circles. And now you, now you perturb the Hamiltonian. What can happen? And the KM theorem tells us that a positive measure set of closed circles they might become distorted. They, they might not look like so nicely round yeah, again anymore, but they stay closed 
they stay close, continuous, closed uh, circle uh, 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 curves, just deformed a little bit, and the whole positive measure set of them uh, still exist. However, between two invariant tori, um, some, some new phenomena can happen. What you can have is you can have closed orbits which become hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic fixed points. Yeah, so each, each periodic orbit will become a fixed point for this return map. Yeah, so uh, you, you, have a, you could have a fixed point in the hyperbolic situation like this, where you have a, um, uh, un, a stable manifold and an unstable manifold. Yeah? And you, you can have many of those. And now what, 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 what can happen is, uh, let's put it like this, you, you have two such hyperbolic fixed points and um, the stable manifold of one fixed point intersects the unstable manifold of the next one. And when they intersect transversely, then near the fixed point you have this stretching and contraction. So this one-dimensional manifold will be folded and stretched. And you will have a lot of intersections of these stable moments. Every intersection will be a new orbit. And these hyperbolic fixed points will, will create positive measure areas of chaotic, I mean, strictly speaking, chaotic behavior. Yeah, you, they, are, they are locally, topologically conjugate to a Bernoulli shift, which is like the optimal situation of such a hyperbolic system with positive entropy and whatever you like. Yeah, so, so the typical picture is that you have um, remaining invariant tori and in between chaotic regions. Yeah, so we have the coexistence of sort of elliptic behavior and in between hyperbolic. And the hyperbolic situation comes from the resonant tori. The resonant tori, they break up, disintegrate, and create this chaotic part and the strongly non-resonant tori with this frequency vector satisfying the Diophantine condition, those are the hardest one which survive stronger perturbations of the Hamiltonian. So this is mathematics. Uh, okay, last minute. This is all mathematics, um, but it's the answer of a question from physics raised in the 19th century. Um, all this theory of symplectic, geometry, Hamiltonian dynamical system, it all started from celestial mechanics in the Middle Ages, yeah, with Copernicus and then Kepler and so on. Liouville, Lagrange developing the techniques to compute. And then eventually, um, those mathematicians realized it's, it seems only in very rare cases, it seems possible to explicitly compute the orbits. Yeah, usually you can only find approximate solutions. So the question was, is it at all possible to find explicit solutions? Explicit solutions are also known as quadrature, yeah, quadrature. It means that you find an algebraic formula. You can only use algebraic formulas and uh, 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 and exponentiation in order to express solutions, starting from an integral. And if this is possible, you call this a um, integrable situation or a solution by quadrature. And those solutions correspond to long time stability. Yeah? If you find so, so, uh, such solutions, this is this this means you can for for arbitrary long time, say what happens with the solutions, in particular whether the system is stable. So, so sort of uh, morally speaking, the question was equivalently to say, so in, in simple terms, the question was, is the solar system stable? Mathematically, it means, can we compute the solutions explicitly? And this question is already a deep unsolved question in general for the three-body problem. And uh, well, 
or unsolvable. So they are, and then Poinc, so this was a prize question. There was an award set out by the King of Norway somehow 1880, and Poincaré by the by the end of the 19th century solved it to the negative. He showed already for the three-body problem, you can have constellations where in finite time um, you it runs in a singularity. Yeah, so two of the bodies. Uh, come so close to uh, to each other that they increase a strong accelerating force towards the third body, such that the third body is kicked out in finite time from the system. And um, uh, so the question becomes stronger. So what about the solar system? Is it of that, of that sort or not? Yeah? Is our solar system stable or not? And um, so this means you really have to figure out um, uh, if you start from the Keplerian description, which is a completely integrable system, yeah, um, then and you and you start doing a perturbation analysis, yeah, so switching on the interactions of the next larger, strong, uh, heaviest planets. So it's a sort of perturbation. You have the completely integrable system, nice Hamiltonian, and you add with a little epsilon a perturbation Hamiltonian. That's the idea. And you ask, okay, so if we, if we know what happens in the completely integrable system, theorem of Arnold Joost Liouville, nicely foliated, quasi-periodic motion, and you perturb it, question what happens? KM theory tells you both happens. For small perturbation, some of the tori will persist. They will just be sort of geometrically deformed, but they will remain invariant tori with quasi-periodic motion. But some tori break up, disintegrate. And the question then, the practical question is, our solar system, our constellation, on what kind of torus are we? Good one or a bad one? And um, so there's one, so that, now I'm stopping. There's, there's a beautiful observation already in the 19th century by an astronomer called Kirkwood, who did statistics for the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There are millions of little, little bodies, some of them heavier, some of them smaller. So for those asteroids, mathematics become much simpler. It's a so-called, you call this a restricted three-body problem. Um, this asteroid sees essentially, so in, in first approximation, it sees in the Keplerian system just the sun, each asteroid moving on an ellipsis. In next approximation, it also sees Jupiter. So it's a three-body problem. However, the asteroid is so light that it definitely will not influence the, the motion of sun or Jupiter. Yeah, so it's not a full general three-body problem, it's a three-body problem of restricted type, and this can be computed in many cases. So for this system, you can definitely do KM theory in a very concrete way. And uh, so the question, and then, so KM theory says, okay, if you look at a concrete asteroid and you want to figure out, is its orbit stable or not? The answer by KM theory depends. It depends on the asteroid's year, yeah, the frequency on its orbit around the sun, compared with the, with the Jupiter's year, the other frequency. These are the two frequencies you have to compare. And if these two frequencies are rationally dependent, you have resonance. The resonance means somehow the rotation of the Jupiter managed to sort of to trigger the, the rotation of the asteroid in a sort of oscillation to become unstable. It's like a spring, yeah, when you when you move the spring up and down in a frequency which is sort of rationally commensurable with the with the proper frequency of the spring, yeah, then you can create resonance. And that's the resonance between Jupiter and asteroid. And this is what Kirkwood observed. He did statistics. He simply counted asteroids. And now by the Keplerian motion, you can, you can um, uh, compute, you can relate the frequency the year with the length of the largest semi-axis. Yeah? So the size of the ellipses corresponds to the time you need to run around. So essentially, he did a statistics. He looked at 
the year of Jupiter is a constant, and if you simply look at um, one axis is the distance of the asteroid to the sun, and on the other axis you simply counted how many asteroids you find. And you, you compared now the distance to the sun with the year of Jupiter, and amazingly you found a lot of asteroids for a ratio which was strongly non-resonant, like the like the uh, golden section, and especially for the for the simple rational numbers one half, two third, three quarters. Yeah, for for the rationals with a small denominator, you you found very few um, uh, asteroids because those were the asteroids in the strongest resonance, most easily to be kicked out by the motion of the Jupiter. So you find these tables in many books on astronomy. It's really surprising. It's, uh, it's the nicest uh, empirical proof of KM theory that uh, rational numbers, uh, the rational numbers mean resonance and mean instability. And if you look for stability in nature, you have to look for the golden section. Okay, full stop, last word. Thank you for attendance.